uh, nice campus. And uh, I'll be staying here for the next six days on the campus. So if anything is unclear during the lectures, you can always uh, catch me, okay, uh, at any time. Well, not at any time, but at reasonable <laughs> times. Okay, uh, okay, good. So uh, I have been given the task to tell you some basic things about uh, quantum statistical mechanics. Of course, this is a very, very broad area as you can imagine. So I'll, I have just decided to take some simple examples to illustrate certain things and uh, that's how we'll go along during the six lectures and the two, two tutorials. Okay? So in the first lecture, I've decided to go slow. But of course, I'll slowly see if the audience already knows most things and you have to interact with me. And then depending on your inputs, I can increase or decrease my speed. Right? So it's up to you. And uh, oh yeah, that's also true. That's a measure zero event. It may even remain the same. Right? So, uh, so yeah, but please during the course of uh, the lectures, please interrupt and ask questions. That's always the way to learn. And especially during this late evening, right? That's a way to keep yourself awake as well, right? So, uh, okay, good. So, uh, uh, so let's start with some basics first. So this has already been discussed in the previous lectures. So let's say we just start with the basic postulate of statistical mechanics, if you wish. So there is some system with a given Hamiltonian and given degrees of freedom and uh, now, let's say you think of some quantum mechanical system and uh, that system is, let's say, kept at a temperature T, right? Then, as we learned, uh, if this system is at equilibrium, uh, is in equilibrium, then it actually implies a certain number of things. So, so the, the, the first thing it implies is, uh, uh, so, so we are starting with the quantum system here, right? So let's say my system has a certain Hamiltonian. I'll soon go to specific examples, right? So right now I'm just giving a certain postulate. So let's say my Hamil uh, system has a certain Hamiltonian, then you know that for many quantum systems, you can then find its uh, energy eigenstates, right? And so maybe these eigenstates have the property that when you act on such a state with the Hamiltonian, you get the energy eigenvalue and the same state back. That's the definition of an energy eigenstate for such a quantum system. Then you can ask that if the system is in thermal equilibrium, what is the probability that such a state occurs, right? You can ask that. So then, Basically, that probability is given by the Gibbs ensemble, right? So that probability is simply, right? This, this you have already encountered for uh, uh, the situations where s the past speakers have introduced uh, uh, systems which are classical and uh, uh, have uh, reached equilibrium, right? So this thing remains the same. Okay, uh, right. And this z, which is the partition function, or if you wish, is a normalization factor here, is of course the sum over all the eigenstates that you have in your system, right? So then these are well defined probabilities, because if you then sum over all these probabilities, you will get one, right? Because of this definition, right? Good. So then if you ask, uh, how do I define the expectation value of some operator uh, at a certain temperature T, that is also sort of straightforward at least to postulate. It may be hard to calculate, right? But uh, mm, then that quantity is just, again, Right? Good? So far, so good? Right. Right. Okay. So now, is some general Hermitian operator, some 
For example, it may be momentum, or for a spin system, it may be total magnetization in a certain spin direction. It's some operator, right? Also, since you asked, of course, in general, n, these states, these eigenstates, in general, they are not eigenstates of A, right? They are just eigenstates of H here. So in general, they are not eigenstates of A, right? But uh, this is the definition, right? Okay. Good. So uh, now, one thing is that, OK, so this is your postulate, and then you can calculate everything. And then you get, uh, for a specific system, you get a specific answer. And uh, you can see how things vary as you vary temperature, so on and so forth, right? So the first thing, which we'll, of course, see many examples of during these lectures, is uh, why is this thing of uh, uh, quantum important here? Of course, uh, the one obvious answer is that uh, uh, we believe that for most of these phenomena, uh, quantum theory is the right theory to do it, right? But there is an even more basic answer. I mean, uh, let's say you even want to distinguish between some phases, right? Some very common phases of matter, let's say a metal versus an insulator, right? So to explain that difference, you crucially need quantum mechanics. You cannot explain that difference using classical statistical mechanics, because you need uh, uh, quantum phenomena, right? Uh, uh, similarly, even to uh, explain some more exotic things like superconductivity, you need quantum uh, mechanics and statistical mechanics together, right? And that's quantum statistical mechanics, right? Uh, sometimes uh, we are given the impression uh, that you know quantum mechanics and uh, its ramifications are there only for very small systems and very low temperatures and so on and so forth but that's not entirely correct you must have all seen bar magnets for example magnets which stick to your fridge i don't know whether i'll have the time to dwell on that later during the talks but basically you can show that uh, if you just had classical statistical mechanics and classical physics, that phenomena couldn't have occurred. Okay, so the phenomenon of magnetism is itself a highly quantum mechanical phenomenon. And of course, you can see it at room temperature. So it's not entirely true to say that uh, quantum mechanics becomes important only when you go to very low temperatures, right? So it depends on the situations that you are in. Okay, good. So now, this is our setup. Right? So now we'll try to uh, use this setup to calculate the partition function and maybe some simple observables for some very simple quantity. Uh, maybe there is a single spin half system sitting in a magnetic field, and we'll try to do this calculation. Right? OK. So yeah, that's what we'll aim for. OK. Also, another thing which I like to highlight, uh, because there was a lot of discussion of what is equilibrium and steady uh, and stationary states and so on here is, of course, uh, in a real life situation, it's a bit tricky to define what is equilibrium. Uh, so I really like uh, this statement in Feynman's uh, uh, statistical mechanics book. So there's this very nice book by Richard Feynman. It's called Statistical Mechanics, a Set of Lectures. That's the name of this book. It's a very nice book. So there Feynman says that uh, uh, basically you can assume that a big enough system is at equilibrium if uh, in whatever time scale you're looking at the system, all the fast processes, so fast is in quotes, right? Because what is fast and what is slow is, of course, a subjective statement. So all the fast processes have uh, long happened. And uh, all the slow processes have yet to happen. So actually, this is a very nice characterization of what is the meaning of equilibrium. And uh, let me give you a very simple example. Because uh, this might sound a little vague. But if you think about it, it's a very precise uh, statement. Uh, and also a very profound statement, yes. 
so, so, so let's see. Let's think of a simple example. Let's say I have somehow made a fresh bar of iron, very pristine fresh bar of iron, and I keep it in this room. And let's say initially I pulled the bar of iron from a fridge and I keep it here on this table. Then maybe after 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, I come and measure the temperature of this bar of iron, it will attain the room temperature, right? Then I'll say that this bar of iron is at room temperature. Okay, good. And it's at equilibrium. Then I come to this bar of iron uh, after 20 days, I realize that there is some rust formed on this iron. So clearly the state of the bar of iron has changed, right? Because uh, rust is a macroscopic property <laughs> of this bar of iron, right? So the state has changed. But then if somebody else has to describe the equilibrium for this system, one has to take that into account as well, right? But if you want to describe this bar for some phenomena which is uh, which is happening at a much uh, shorter time scale than this rusting process of iron, you can ignore rusting, right? That's exactly what this means, right? So I hope the statement is clear, right? And of course, if you keep this bar of iron for 10 million years, right, maybe the room in which you had kept this bar of iron is not there anymore, right? Not maybe, it's most likely not there anymore if you just wait for 10 million years, right? And uh, so then, of course, uh, the entire state and the description you would use for that has changed, right? So this is actually a very interesting statement and you can think more deeply about that. Good. So that's it. I'll leave it here at that and now I'll just work with these things. Good? Right. Okay. Oh, sorry. So I should erase the word long. Okay. So yeah, yeah. So sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So actually, the fast processes are happening, right? But uh, your time scale of probing, the fast processes are happening many, many, many times, right? So in that sense, they are effectively averaged out. Exactly like the Brownian motion example we studied in the morning, right? So yeah. I mean, uh, whenever I write something in English. There is some imprecision there. I mean, this is precise, right? That's why you use mathematics to write. So, uh, but yeah. So basically, this just means that your T observation is much, much uh, bigger than this fast thing and is much, much smaller than this slow thing. That's what, that's all. Okay, good. So far, so good? Right. Yes? Oh, so in this formula, if I'm writing all the eigenstates of my system, you don't need to explicitly worry about the degeneracy. Suppose three states are degenerate with each other. This will just automatically be counted in the formula. Uh, you see, so this is completely general. This is completely general. Good. Any other questions? All right. So now, you see, here, when I wrote uh, this thing, and this thing, you may object and you may say, oh, you have used a special basis. You have used the energy basis here, right? Energy eigenstate here. I mean, shouldn't I be able to write this formula in any other basis that I want, right? For example, suppose you're solving the simple harmonic oscillator problem in quantum mechanics, right? Then you know, I mean, at least for these simple examples, we know what the energy eigenstates are. But you could have asked, oh, can't I write all these formulas in just the x basis or just the p basis, right? So the answer is yes. So in quantum mechanics, we know that uh, uh, suppose I'm given one uh, uh, basis, uh, then there is always, it's always possible to go to another basis by doing a unitary transformation, okay? So for example, if you know your state vector in position space, I mean, of course, in principle, you can transform it to momentum space. You can transform into some other basis, right? So we can actually use that freedom in quantum mechanics to write this thing in a slightly better manner so that this thing doesn't remain basis dependent. That's all. Okay. So let me just write that. So these things will also be true in general. Exactly like this thing is true in general. So then the partition function is just trace of e to the minus beta h. So this h is an operator, right? Good. And this a, this a is trace of. 
So whenever I have this symbol here, usually I just keep it reserved for operators. Okay. Good. So that's it. Right? Okay. Uh, so then you can actually verify for yourself that uh, if you use some other basis, not the energy eigen basis, and just use this, uh, you will get exactly the same answers. Of course, if you use the energy basis, then these matrices, for example, this matrix becomes diagonal. Then you can obviously see taking the traces exactly giving you this formula, right? But in more complicated situations also, you can uh, verify that this is uh, uh, always true and this and this means exactly the same thing. Okay, good. So now let's do a simple example to illustrate this concept. Let's actually do some simple calculation to illustrate this. So example is, there is a single spin half uh, degree of freedom and uh, the Hamiltonian is that uh, there is some magnetic field acting on this uh, spin half degree of freedom. Right? So this is my problem. Right? So it's a single spin. I assume that it's at equilibrium at a temperature T. And I have given you this Hamiltonian. Now, of course, uh, as I said, if I want to solve this thing, then I somehow, let's say, have to calculate the partition function. Then if you ask me what is the average S, S, SZ, for example, then I have to use this formula, so on and so forth. Right? So let's just use this for this very simple example. Right? Let's just do that. Right? Okay. So far, so good? Uh, okay. Good. So as I said, I'll start very gently, so so that people are with me. So, okay, okay. So now, uh, let's say my preferred basis to write these things is uh, the SZ basis, right? So then I say that uh, these two states, these two states, just mean. Sorry, sorry. Say that again. Oh, here it's the Hamiltonian. My magnetic field is in the z direction, right? That's why, because uh, the magnetic field is in the z direction, you automatically know that this is also the. It's not the partition function. Oh no 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 no! Sorry, I mean, yeah yeah, it's not the partition. Ha! Huh, this is capital Z. This is small Z. This is partition function. Oh, I can use a different symbol if you want. I, maybe like this but you see my handwriting is not so good so ultimately it'll just uh, deviate into good perfect yes okay so for this simple problem everybody knows what the two eigenstates are right i mean so it's just uh, uh, so this is let's say my basis so this is uh, up spin in the z direction this is down spin in the z direction right and you also know what the energy eigenvalues are, right? So if I just take this guy, I'll get a minus h times the same guy, right? Because it's an energy eigenket. And if I take the other guy, I'll get plus, right? So this is straightforward, right? So density matrix. Yeah, you can introduce it, but this is basically the same. I mean, uh, there is a notion of probability here and that's basically the same as. Good thing about density matrix yeah. is that you, once you write it as a trace, I mean, it is independent of the basis that you. Yeah, so that's exactly what I said. I mean, this thing is exactly the same as this thing. Right. And I'll actually try to illustrate it in this simple example. Yeah. I mean, it's just a symbol, right? I mean, okay, fine. Oh, is it familiar? Okay, when I was in college, uh, Rho was not familiar to me. Okay. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> right. Okay. I see, I see. 
rho is the inner product of what? Of what? Sorry. No, that's not. Uh, yeah, you can write it like that. But the, this is uh, if you are in the if you are considering a situation which is at uh, equilibrium at temperature t. I mean, uh, this is the operator representation for rho. Then you can write it in any basis. If you write it in the energy basis, if you write it in the energy basis, what you are saying is absolutely correct. But you can write it in any other basis. And can I write the same thing in terms of uh, energy basis? Yeah, yeah, you can. And then it'll just reduce to uh, this one. I mean, uh, uh. sorry. What is the question? I mean, uh, uh, so basically. Uh, uh, it'll just look like this. Let me be faithful to my notation. Uh, so something like this. Yeah. I mean, that's your outer product, and these pi's are these pi's. Uh, so. Correct. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's absolutely true because this is an operator. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So I think it'll become clearer when I do an example here. So let me do that example here. This is the general definition, right? And the, then for a specific case, you do a specific calculation. So I'll do an example here in which I'll calculate uh, these things in two ways. One is just by going into the energy eigenbasis. That's very simple. The other is if you wish by expanding this exponential, doing a Taylor expansion, and then actually calculating the trace, right? Then, yeah, that's another way of doing it. This is equilibrium statmic. So in quantum mechanics, you have the Hilbert space now, yeah, not, the not the phase space, uh, right? I mean, classical mechanics and quantum mechanics are different, right? That's it. Yeah. So, right. But I mean, let's go on with an example, right? Yeah. So, right. Good. So, right. So let's say I give you this information. I told you that. Uh, these are my energy eigenkets. There are two energy eigenkets here, right? Can I mean, then of course you know how to write the partition function, right? Let's say you use this definition, this simple definition, uh, this one, right? So then you know how to write the partition function. So I'll just write down the partition function, right? This is your partition function, right? So now suppose somebody tells you to calculate some expectation value. Let's say, let's say you want to calculate the expectation value of SZ. Uh, can somebody tell me what should be, uh, let's say on the numerator, the denominator is of course Z again, right, by this rule. So the denominator is uh, this. Uh, what do you think the numerator is? You just need to use this, right? So there are two terms in the numerator, obviously. So yeah, what do you think? Uh, the numerator is. Sorry? No, no, don't say tanish. There are two terms in the numerator. You, you think of this definition, right? So plus a minus. Plus? Correct, correct, correct. So this is SZ, right? And I have to calculate it uh, on these two states, right? So that's straightforward. So if you just uh, do this calculation, for one thing, you'll get a plus one here. And this is the energy factor you get. And for the other thing, you get a minus one. And this is the energy factor. 
I, I please tell me if you follow this much, right? Okay, good. So then you have this familiarity with quantum mechanics, right? So good. Uh, so then, of course, as somebody said, this is exactly equal to tan hyperbolic beta h. Okay, so far so good. Now let me ask you a question, and uh, let's see if we can uh, solve that. Oh, we can always go to that board. So expectation value of this operator was simple, right? Because uh, this operator is uh, basically these two I, these two states are also eigenstates of this operator, right? Now let's say I ask you to calculate this for the same system. Uh, does somebody know how to approach this problem? Uh, sorry, what? Yeah. Oh, here, here. This one. Yeah. Uh, oh, I see. I see. Thank you for asking that. Okay. See. Uh, okay. Okay. Good. 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 See, as I said, if you think of this trace in the energy eigenstate basis, then it simplifies to this. Right? I mean, uh, so, okay, another way of saying this is, if you think of this operator in the energy eigen basis, it's a diagonal operator. Right? And it's a diagonal operator and then you just take the sum and that's your trace and you're done. So, what is, the, the two energy eigen functions are sz equal to plus 1 and sz equal to minus 1, if you wish. And for the plus 1, the energy eigen value is minus h, right? So then you put, for E n you put minus h and that's exactly what this term gives you, e to the power plus beta h. And then the next term is due to this, right? And therefore there are two terms, right? So you just calculate the trace in this basis, that's it. You just calculate it, it's a two by two matrix and that's what you get. Uh, there's nothing mysterious here, right? Mu. Oh, yeah, 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 there are all these mu's and whatever, but I mean, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, let's say I have absorbed my mu in this H. You're absolutely correct. There are some uh, Bohr magneton and things like that, some constants, but uh, for making my life simple, I have just written it in this form. Yeah, but you're correct. But even if there is a mu, we clearly know how to just straightforwardly write the answer. Right. Okay, good. Now, how do I calculate this? This is slightly more complicated. Computing? Computing? But uh, you see, in your way of doing it, there are too many assumptions. Can you prove all those assumptions yourself? Actually, if you do it like that, your answer will be incorrect. Uh, yeah, because in quantum mechanics, there are operators which don't commute with each other. So yeah, so, so then uh, how would I calculate this, right? So to calculate this, I of course have to again calculate this expectation value, right? Uh, do people know what is this expectation value? So I have defined my basis here, right? Uh, so this is in the SZ basis, right? Uh, good. So do people know what is this expectation value? Why? Okay, yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's absolutely correct. So if you want to write SX as an operator in this basis, you would write this, right? Sorry? Uh, yeah, probably. But no, actually, you don't need a root 2 here. You don't need a root 2. What is not normalized? You mean the state? No, the state is normalized. The norm, yeah, the state is normalized. I mean, I, uh, I just say that this is one. Yeah, yeah, this is correct. I mean, there's no root to here. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. Right, and similarly, since I'm writing this, S Y. Here is, uh, yeah, good, that's absolutely correct. 
this. And SZ is, of course, a very simple thing to write, right? Right, right, good. So, expectation of SX is 0, and similarly, expectation of SY is also 0, right? So, very simply, we get uh, the partition function here, and for some simple thing, we know the expectation of SZ. That is a function of your temperature and your magnetic field, right, in this particular way. And uh, SX and SY are independent of uh, your magnetic field. They are always zero. Okay, good. So now, this was a simple and quick way of calculating this. Now let me calculate uh, this thing in a slightly more complicated way just by using these definitions. Okay, and, but the whole point of this exercise is to show you that you will get exactly the same thing. Okay, good. So now, let us first calculate the trace. So let us first just calculate the trace and uh, so, uh, so you see now I am trying to just calculate the trace. So one simple strategy is to tailor expand this exponential, right? Because if I just give you this function uh, and I say that I am not allowing you to use this basis, you might not find the trace immediately, right? Because it is hard to exponentiate a matrix in take its trace. So then the strategy is to do a Taylor expansion here, right? So let us just do that. Good. So far so good. Now there is a very nice simplification which happens here. Uh, so, uh, we are using this particular Hamiltonian here, right? This particular Hamiltonian with the minus sign, of course. This is my Hamiltonian. So, then we can just insert that here. and so on and so forth. Now, let us see if there is some simplification here. Okay. So, you know the action of this operator on these states. This is just uh, uh, plus 1 times this guy again. This is just minus 1 times that guy again. right? So, what do you think is the action of SZ square on these states? So, plus 1, right? So, SZ square is an identity operator, right? What is the action of SZ cube on these two states? Because you get plus 1 and minus 1. So, SZ cube is like SZ, right? So, that is an operator relationship, right? Uh, so, that is it. You can use that here, right? So, you will just get two kinds of terms in this giant sum. Terms which are just proportional to SZ and terms which are just proportional to identity. And you know how to take the trace of both the identity matrix and the SZ matrix, right? So you see where I'm going, right? Good. What should be plus? Ah, that's correct. That's correct. Uh, that's absolute. Wait, wait, wait. This is minus. This plus. This minus. So which one should be plus? Ah, right, right. That's true. So there's a minus and that's plus, right? Good, good. Yeah, you should catch me with signs, right? Um, yeah, uh, good. So, so now if we take the trace and we use these two properties that I said, that the even power of SZ square, is, sorry, the even power of SZ is just the identity and the odd power is just SZ itself, then we can do this trace very easily, right? So, uh, I leave you some steps to verify in, the, in between, but they are not hard. so on. So, it will be like all the even powers would appear here. And then, so all the odd powers will appear here, but with alternating signs. So, here they will appear with the same sign. Here they will appear with alternating signs. Okay. So, in fact, that means I was actually correct about the thing here. 
So here they'll occur with alternating signs. Okay, so then of course I can very easily see what is going to happen. If I trace this part, just this part, what do you think I'll get? If I just trace this part. No, 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 think carefully. I'm tracing this part. This is just some number. Maybe it's a cos, maybe it's a cos hyperbolic, whatever. This is just some number, but then I have to trace this matrix. Sorry? Two. Zero, right, correct, correct, zero, not two. Uh, I'll get two if I trace this, which is the identity, right? So then good. So for the partition function, I don't even need to worry about this thing, right? Because this trace is just this trace plus that trace. That's a matrix identity. And then I know that this is a traceless matrix. So I don't need to worry about it. I just worry about this thing, right? And then you can easily show that this thing is just two cos hyperbolic beta h. Okay, and this thing is actually identical to this thing. Good. So now we have agreed that this way and that way gives us the same answer for this simple system. And uh, I'm telling you that this is a more general statement. Okay, good. Now let's also calculate this as the expectation value. And then we'll stop with this example. Okay, so just to show that we get e exactly the same thing here. Right, good. Okay, so when we calculate as said, uh, uh, so let me actually just erase this portion, right? Because I want to use the results there. So let me just erase this portion. Okay, so now uh, we'll use this definition, right? We'll use this definition. So, Of course, I know what Z is. Z is just 2 cos hyperbolic beta times H, right? Good. So now, I already showed you that uh, e to the minus beta H, this I already showed just now, is cos hyperbolic. Well, I didn't arrange the terms like this, but you can easily see that one series with the identity gives you a cos hyperbolic, the other series gives you a sine hyperbolic, okay? This I just now showed you by doing the Taylor series expansion. Good? Right. So then this thing is nothing but the numerator is nothing but, right? Why is it? Because there was an identity there and identity times SZ is just SZ. And what is the second term? There is an SZ there and there is an SZ there. So this is identity again, right? Good. times this thing. Now you can already see the nice thing. For the trace uh, of the partition function, uh, this term contributed and this did not. Here is just the reverse thing, right? Because uh, uh, this will give you a finite trace, this term, whereas this will again give you a zero trace, right? Okay, good. And when you actually do that, what you'll just get from the numerator is, 2 sine hyperbolic beta h and the denominator is beta h. So that's tan hyperbolic beta h, right? And this is exactly the same as this result, right? Good. So I hope I have convinced everyone, at least in this simple example, that this guy gives you exactly the same as uh, this, right? Good. Okay, and this also. Uh, tells you the physics of uh, 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 one spin in a <coughs> magnetic field. And uh, if you have a bunch of n very weakly interacting spins, right? Let's say you have very weakly interacting spins and you raise them at a temperature T. 
Essentially, you can get all the answers by just multiplying prefactors of n here, right? If you have very weak interactions between the spins, right? So this already tells you something. So, and uh, if you want to, for example, uh, sort of graphically see what this behavior is, uh, let's say for the average magnetization, so this is 0 and this is 1 and this is a tan hyperbolic function. So I'm plotting it as a function of beta h, right? So it basically starts like this and then goes like this. So here the behavior, so uh, this drawing is not very accurate, but here the behavior is linear, right? With magnetic field. And then here, uh, as a function of magnetic field, this behavior becomes uh, nonlinear as the magnetic field becomes high, if you wish, right? Even for where does the magnetic field come from? Ah, I, here I'm just applying it uh, using uh, whatever some. So uh, so imagine that uh, I have some uh, what is that thing called electromagnet in an experiment, and I'm cranking up some magnetic field, and uh, whatever is interacting with this is through some Zeeman interaction. This is like a Zeeman term in my Hamiltonian. Here, here, here. This is the this is H. No, no, but there's a prefactor H, right? Oh, so generally you can think of the coupling like this. This is the usual Zeeman coupling. This is the usual Zeeman coupling. What is H? H is a magnetic field. Sorry, I'm very confused with notations now. What do you mean this is Planck's? Con no, no, this is just an external magnetic field. Okay, you can call it B if you wish. Okay. This is the Hamiltonian. Right, and this is uh, just a Zeeman coupling. So there is a magnetic field which you have introduced in your lab, and this spin degree of freedom is interacting with this magnetic field, right? And usually, if there is an external magnetic field, <coughs> if the spin points along the magnetic field, that's energetically favorable, right? That's exactly what this thing is doing, right? This is a dot product, right? So if this S becomes along the magnetic field, you can see that this. Hamiltonian is sort of minimized, right? Of course, I'm sort of arguing this classically, but you see roughly why this is the correct interaction too. Uh, magnitude of the magnetic field, then it's the magnitude. But that's exactly what I have done, right? H is the magnitude of the magnetic field, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's say B is then H times S Z. Uh, h in the z hat direction. Then you use this here and you get exactly this, right? Then it's right, right? Okay, good, perfect. Okay, <coughs> sorry. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, right. So later on, uh, maybe in a few more lectures, we'll see a slightly more a uh, complicated version of this calculation where we'll also introduce interactions between spins. These are non-interacting spins, so it's very easy to uh, get the <coughs> answer. Okay, so now I'll actually, uh, yeah. Uh, this one. What is the? Uh, you must be able to write the state vector for what? For the system in thermal state vector. No, no, no. See, when the system is in thermal equilibrium, there is an associate probability for each possible state right so and so so classically this is simple classically you can say that there is a state uh, cn or some configuration cn and that has a particular probability of occurrence right? good see quantum mechanically this is tricky right quantum mechanically this is tricky because uh, suppose i tell you that there is some uh, basis i have taken then you can ask me what's special about that basis. There's nothing special about that basis, right? So, I mean, 
classically if i have a configuration that configuration just stays there quantum mechanically uh, if i give you a hamiltonian the only configurations which are stationary are energy eigen vectors right because uh, if you do a unitary time evolution of those energy eigen vectors they just pick up a phase right all other uh, states would keep on changing right so if you want to think in that language the corresponding analog of that is this guy right the uh, energy eigen ket right but <laughs> that is also not very precise so i mean yeah so when the eigen vectors are given basically if you wish this is the probability with which let's say the state with energy eigen value en occurs this is the probability right so it's not that you can say that this is the state at this particular time you cannot say that if a system is in equilibrium right you can always only make some probabilistic statements and the correct statement to make is if your energy eigen ket has this energy e of n this is the probability of its occurrence right i mean uh, i don't know how to explain it in any no, these are again just words. some words right i mean yeah ultimately you are also thinking in terms of probabilities right i don't know if i am able to understand what are the other parameters of the system no no that's not correct so suppose i give you a box of atoms right uh, which has a large number of particles right and it's a thermal uh, equilibrium do you think that at any point of time you actually know the absolute state of the system uh, i must know the h then no no but h, knowing h does not mean that you know the state of the system those are two different things right h is just the specification of if you wish the interactions between degrees of freedom of my system h is the hamiltonian right but the state of the system is something else yeah why you are solving it right so you are solving it and finding the eigen states of your problem right and then you have to populate those eigen states according to the gibbs ensemble uh, i don't know whether that helps in the understanding i mean So, so the things which are fixed. Suppose you have an interacting system, right? Exactly like in classical statistics, maybe you can say that the volume is fixed, the magnetic field is fixed, and so on and so forth. They define the parameters of your Hamiltonian and your interaction, right? Those things are of course contained here, right? Because uh, this is the Hamiltonian. It contains the information about those parameters which you hold fixed, right? And then you solve the uh, eigenstate problem. and then you are also given that the system is at equilibrium at temperature t so you realize that the probability that an energy eigen state whose energy is en occurs is exactly this i mean uh, uh, right
What do you mean? What do you mean? I mean, here it's known, right? I just solved you. I just solved the thing here, right? No, 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 but the, no, 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 no. But the many body eigenstates are still known. Right, okay, see, okay. Then it'll get me to territory where I don't want to get into the first lecture. But suppose you're given a many body Hamiltonian, right? Uh, okay, you can always find the energy eigenstates of that problem, right? There's nothing unspecified. I mean, you can in principle find them. Uh, of course, uh, you can get energy eigenstates where you cannot just say that this is the characteristic of particle 1 and that's the characteristic of particle 2. Uh, those kinds of states uh, where you cannot do that are called entangled states. Uh, and there are other states where you can do that. I mean, e uh, just to give you a simple example for spin systems. Let's say instead of one spin, I have two spins. And uh, I just again write things in my SZ basis, right? So let's say I write this state, right? I mean, of course, if I write this kind of a state, uh, and you can show that this is an eigenstate of a certain Hamiltonian as well. But see, in this state, you cannot just say that, OK, uh, this particle has a probability of being plus 1 and that particle has a probability of being minus 1 and so on and so forth. If this is plus 1, you uniquely know that this is minus 1. And if it's the other way around, you also uniquely know it, right? So that is difficult to decide. decide. I think we are arguing about philosophies here, right? I mean, this is the mathematical setup, right? Uh, I don't understand what's the confusion. We will discuss it later. Yeah, I think that's the best thing, right? But. Uh, uh, there's nothing imprecise about this formulation. Yeah, yeah. So, this is the Hamiltonian for the whole system. Yes, exactly. Whenever you measure it, it will collapse to one of the eigenstates, right? The value of the energy. In an isolated system. But that's a that's a that's a different yeah, thing, different. right? Different. Yes. Even if you get an eigenstate, I don't know how to interpret this P L. Like. Uh, what do you mean? Even if you get an eigenstate. Because this is a thermal equilibrium. Because this is a system which is actually connected to an external system, very big external system, and somehow it's at equilibrium with that external system. I guess uh, in one of the previous lectures of Shami, maybe he did this thing that there is a huge system and there's a small subsystem and somehow it's at equilibrium. You see, if you look at the derivation very carefully, there is no reference to whether something is quantum or classical here. That's it. I mean, if you assume that this is much smaller than this and somehow these two things are at equilibrium, you'll always get, always get this kind of an ensemble description. Right. I mean, uh, just comes out from there. Well, those coefficients will change because, uh, right. But I think this is an unnecessarily confusing way of thinking about the thing, right? I mean, uh, see, uh, saying that some system is at thermal equilibrium is a very powerful statement. And that just restricts many things, as you must have appreciated during the course of these lectures. So one simplification that you get out of this is that it basically tells you what the mixed, quote unquote, mixed density matrix of this subsystem is. And that's exactly this. This is this. This is the specification of the problem. 
If you wish, there's the postulate, which we start with when we are doing uh, statistical mechanics, if you wish. Right? And I mean, when you learn Newton's laws, for example, you started with some postulates. You can take one minute. <laughs> Yeah, this thing has nothing to do with classical or quantum. This derivation of Gibbs ensemble. But the way you give the energy, Exactly. That's why that's why I stressed on the fact that these are energy eigenstates, right? And then I said that the, of course you can write it in any basis, and I showed this, right? So, yeah. States are. Correct, correct. Configurations. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, but uh, if you just think about it, this is a postulate and you can go ahead and apply this, okay? And uh, really the way this comes about uh, is exactly from this derivation. Uh, this, uh, yeah, right. I mean, somehow we tend to uh, unnecessarily sometimes make quantum things very murky. I mean, see, whether it's classical mechanics or quantum mechanics, right? You have to follow a set of rules and you have to make uh, all your calculations and deductions from there, right? So these are the rules here, right? And these are perfectly general rules. You give me any quantum system, you do this, you do this, you do this, and that's your answer, that's your uh, expectation value at any temperature t, right? So that's it. Yes. 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 It's it's called a random phase approach, right? Yeah, yeah. But you see, I didn't want to introduce it here because uh, it's it doesn't uh, it doesn't it doesn't give you any extra physical insight, right? So, right. I mean, uh, uh, no, no. I mean. <laughs> See, okay, you can just take this that uh, this is the correct way of uh, this is the this is the postulate where quantum statistical mechanics starts, right? Okay, uh, you can try to rationalize it in many ways, but uh, ultimately all those ways will give you this and very little extra insights, right? Exactly, exactly, right. So I, I don't find any of those ways uh, perfectly satisfying. So I mean, that's it. This is it, right? Okay, good. So I'm already running behind schedule, but that's okay. There were enough questions, and as I said, uh, you can ask me questions later on as well, right? So good. But I would just like to restress again: if there is a many-body Hamiltonian. 
these eigenkets are the many body eigenkets. So you should just keep that in mind, right? So this is, if you just think about it, this is a perfectly self-contained setup. Just think about it, it's perfectly self-contained. You don't need any extra information. Right. Okay, so now I like to do uh, two more simple problems today, which can be easily done. One is basically, okay, now that I have introduced this notation, I can say it. One is basically this density matrix for a single particle, so a free particle in a box. And the second is the density matrix of two identical particles in a box, right? So in both the examples, which will be very simple examples, we'll already see some things extra, uh, which, won't, uh, which wouldn't have appeared if we did just classical statistical mechanics, right? Okay, so let's just do those examples. So the first example is one particle, so one free particle in a box. Okay, so, so there's a box, uh, maybe it's a cubic box, right, with side L, right? So there's a volume uh, L cube. And of course, it's a free particle, so let's just say that the Hamiltonian is just this, right? This is my Hamiltonian, because it's a free particle. Good. So then, of course, uh, I know that the right way to solve this problem is to go to the momentum basis, and uh, the momentum uh, the, the, the momentum states, states with a well-defined momentum value are also energy eigenstates here, right? So, good. So then what you can do, so I should actually introduce a vector sign here, but sometimes I'll forget to introduce it. So, right. So, this guy is so on, right? So far so good. Also, uh, this is something which I'm sure has been introduced in previous lectures. Let's say I assume periodic boundary conditions for simplicity, right? So if I assume periodic boundary conditions, then you know that this uh, momentum is also quantized, right? Good. So basically then this k is, right, where L is the linear dimension of the box. And uh, this n is, of course, a collection of these three numbers and these three numbers can of course be plus minus 1 plus minus 2 and so on and so forth right these are integers right so this is the specification of the problem right now i can of course express a state like this in some particular representation let's say i express it in uh, position space let's say I Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Then this is it, right? So far, so good, right? This is just a free particle in a box, right? And these are the energy eigenstates, right? Good. So now, let's first uh, calculate this e to the minus beta h, this trace in the position basis. Okay, let's first do this calculation. Good. So, let's do this calculation. So, I hope it's immediately clear to you that uh, in this problem uh, of a single particle in a box, uh, even if x and x prime are not the same, even then this matrix element can be non-zero. Right? I hope that's clear to you. Right? And clearly that's a quantum effect, right? Because classically that can never happen. If you had a classical particle like this, then of course, if x and x prime are not identical, this thing would not have been non-zero. Okay, good. So now let's just try to calculate this. And this will already tell us something. So uh, how do you think I should calculate it? I mean, there are of course many ways of calculating it, but what do you think is the most simple way of calculating? Sorry? Something right. Which, so which, uh, which, momentum correct, basis. correct. Because I know that in the momentum basis, this guy is diagonal, right? This guy. Good. So then as they said, I do exactly that. Right? 
right? And this is diagonal, right? This is diagonal, this guy, okay? Good. So then, because this is diagonal, I can just uh, right, and then I use this relation to uh, just write this out in detail. Okay. Good. So far, so good. Right. So now, uh, another thing which you must have already seen is, if I take this uh, box to be very large, then you can see that uh, the separation between different momenta decreases uh, rapidly, right? Because the separation between two consecutive momenta is 1 by L. So if my box is really large, that separation is really small. So then I can think of this k as uh, continuous variable and I can convert this sum into an integral. I am almost sure you have uh, seen this during this lecture, right? If but, but if there is any confusion, I can tell you in private, I mean, how to do it. I mean, it is not so hard, right? So, basically, you do this. So, basically, this sum can be converted into an integral like this. Okay, and here I have just used this relation. So, we can do that. So, we do that and then we also realize that this is a Gaussian integral. So, we actually try to tackle this Gaussian integral. So, then what do we, what do I get? So, I get this. So, this is a shorthand, this is a shorthand for these three integrations, right? So, that is why I put a vector sign here. So, now, this looks almost like a Gaussian integral. Well, so, I mean, do people know how to solve such integrals? I mean, we can consider the one dimensional form of it, right? I mean, uh, then you can forget about, well, you can do the k x, k y, k z integral separately if you wish. So, the, the, the issue here is that there is this uh, imaginary part appearing here and then there is this real part appearing here, right? So, uh, do people know how to solve this kind of Okay, okay, okay. I see. By by showing the contour and uh, okay, fine. So this integral can be done, uh, and I'll just state the result. And uh, right, uh, but actually, people should try to do this integral carefully when this is imaginary and this is real. Just try to do it at home. Okay, and of course, the limits are minus infinity to plus infinity. You would realize that if you have to do it properly, you have to use some contour integration. It's just a nice exercise to do. So I encourage everyone to do this. Okay, I mean, of course, if there is no i here, then it's completely straightforward to do. But if there's an i here, it's slightly more tricky. Uh, fortunately, the answer is basically the same. Yes, but yeah, exactly the same. No, not semicircle. You cannot choose this. No, so okay. This is homework exercise. Do this contour integration uh, at home. Okay. And uh, you, no, it's not a semicircle. No. Okay, good. So I'll just write down the result now. Okay, so I'll erase this part. So, I will erase this part and I will just write down the result. So, sorry. So, this is again for the free particle, right, in some three dimensional box like this. So, then 
I have introduced a symbol here, which I'll define shortly. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> yeah. See, I'm trying to follow the standard symbols, right? Not to confuse every, anyone, right? So it's good to just follow the standard symbol. So of course, this is basically like two vectors and this means that you take the vector difference, that's a third vector and take the modulus and then the square, right? So good, so far so good. And then as somebody rightly said, this is just the thermal de Broglie wavelength, okay? Sorry, how should I pronounce it? Uh, yeah, okay, whatever Shamik is saying. <laughs> See, right from my childhood, I have had some problems with pronouncing French names. So, so yeah, so, so please excuse me, okay? And for the correct pronunciations, refer to Shamik. So, uh, that's correct. <laughs> okay, good. Right, so this is something which you may have already seen, right? This is called the thermal de Broglie wavelength and basically the way it uh, occurs is basically you can define a wavelength like this and f uh, if you think loosely then the typical kinetic energy uh, for a particle is of the order of kBT at thermal equilibrium and from that you can get some relation like this, right? So, okay, good. So, this is, uh, this is uh, what happens. Okay, so far so good. So, now uh, let us see what we learn out of this. Uh, let me just do one more small thing. Uh, so, what is the partition function here? So, let us say I use this result, right? I have already told you what this is. Now, can somebody tell me if I want to calculate the partition function in this basis, what is the expression I should write? Uh, just think about it, it is not hard, right? So, I want to calculate the partition function using this result. So, what is the expression I should write? So, I am doing some trace, right? So, clearly there is some integral and then what else should I write? Sorry? Uh, I cannot hear you. Can you repeat it? Uh, okay, yeah. So, so, so let us first write the expression, right? Uh, good. Uh, so, here I am just doing a trace, right? So, I should just write the same x here into d 3 x, right? So, this is the expression for the trace, right? So, then it is very easy. You see, why is it easy? Because when x and x prime are identical, then this factor just goes away, right? So, this is a straightforward thing to do, right? So, you do all this and you can show that your answer for a single particle is just this, it is just this. This is your partition function for a single particle. So, already it tells you one simple thing immediately that uh, you get this factor of uh, h cube in the denominator, which uh, uh, when you do ideal gases or something like that and especially you want to calculate things like entropy and other things. I mean, you insert this kind of a factor by hand, right? This h cube and then you say, oh, the reason this is because somehow you have this phase space of x comma p and then you have to remember that you have to break it into cells and things like that, but that's not at all satisfactory, right? So, this is a straightforward way to see that there is this factor of uh, h cube. And of course, if you take n particles, it will generalize to h to the power 3 n. Right? So, this is completely straightforward way to appreciate this factor, right? Good. What? There is also an n factor will. Now, after this, I will do the two particle problem in a box and then you will see that factor also coming. Right. But this is a very simple illustration of that, right? And that n factorial comes in classical mechanics again in a ad hoc manner, there is something called uh, uh, Gibbs paradox of mixing of gases. Again, this is not something I would like to discuss here. If somebody is interested, I can s try to explain in private again. But uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, uh, those things are ad hoc. But so here it already comes up. Good. Another thing which you should appreciate is the following. See, I said that the non-classical bit here was that 
this matrix had these off diagonal elements, right? So you look at this. This is again like a Gaussian, and this dictates the width of the Gaussian, right? So now, if you're looking at length scales which are much, much larger, so uh, length scales which are much, much larger than this length scale here, then you can ignore this exponential, right? So now you can immediately see what's happening. Suppose you raise your temperature to some very high temperature, right? Then you see this. Uh, uh, wavelength is getting smaller and smaller, right? So clearly that means that as t tends to infinity, because this lambda is getting very small, you actually recover the classical limit, right? So this is another straightforward thing you get out of this derivation, right? So we get two things. One is this, and the second is uh, how is this problem, even this very simple problem, different from the classical problem, right? Good. So far, so good. Now. Yeah, so one way of thinking about it is, uh, suppose uh, my particle is, is, is in a certain eigenstate, then of course there is still an amplitude that it can go from x to x prime, right? And uh, exactly, even within the eigenstate. So that's exactly what this thing is saying, right? And Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's okay. Which quantity? Oh, this quantity. I'm just calculating this operator, or if you put a z in the denominator, this is just the density matrix. I'm just calculating the uh, density matrix in the position representation. That's it. I'm just calculating it in the position representation. Well, yeah, okay, it's helpful. Yes, yes, right, you can say so. But I could have found z in an easier manner by using p here, for example. Uh, or K, right? So, yeah. I mean, I did this to illustrate the fact. See, this is actually helpful to see this limit, this classical limit appearing. There, it's really helpful. Yeah. To calculate that, uh, you can use this or any other basis. Yeah. So, actually, uh, oh, there are, oh, this is correct, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. Ah, that's a good way of thinking about it. Yes. But let me take a small pause here because uh, uh, the next thing I want to do is two particles in a box which requires more concentration. So <laughs> if you have any questions, then I can try to answer it right now about anything. I mean, if there are immediate questions, otherwise I go to two particles in a box. So far, so good? Okay. So now I go to two particles in a box and I require your utmost concentration. Yeah, please. So you don't want to give your utmost concentration. What do you mean? Uh, oh, I see, I see. Mm. No, no, it will come. I mean, of course, you can choose an operator A in the position basis, right? And you can measure some cross correlation even. Yeah, so it will come. It will come. In fact, you can think of it like this, right? I mean, this is a probability amplitude of the particle going from x to x prime instantaneously in time. Right? This is exactly that. This is just a probability amplitude of the particle going from x to x prime instantaneously. No, no, no. This. Correct, so correct. Like superfluids, yeah. etc. So right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. System. That's called off-diagonal long-range order. Very yes, that's very significant. But but already here you can appreciate that uh, why quantum mechanics is different from classical, right? Even in this simple problem. Yeah. Okay. Good. So now I go to the second problem. And I will apologize to you in advance because I'll exceed 6 p.m. But I won't exceed by much.
By the way, when is dinner? Oh, oh, then I'm okay. No, 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 I didn't mean that. No, but you see, uh, I also have my own limitations. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, as I said, I'm around here, right? So you can always discuss at dinner or at breakfast. So it's not a problem. Yeah, but uh, yeah, usually I feel uncomfortable going too much out of uh, line with the given time. So. So now we do this problem and here I'll mention the crucial steps and I'll leave some steps for you as homework, okay? And if somebody is stuck, uh, please uh, ask me, but try to do it yourself. Nothing is uh, uh, very complicated. So there are two particles, again, free. So basically there is P1 square by 2n plus uh, P2 square by 2n and again, exactly in the same boundary condition, right? So then of course we know what the uh, basis is, uh, the right energy uh, basis is, it's just this. And of course, we know what this is. And again, these k1s and k2s are quantized, right? So now suppose I want to write this in, again, position basis, right? Let's say I again want to write this in the position basis, which just means uh, I do this. Then uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, what is the symbol I use for these things? Uh, let me use a symbol here, which is uk of x, okay, for this. Let me just use this symbol for this. So this thing is just this function, okay, right. So then this guy is so far so good. But does anybody notice the problem? Because I told you that this is a problem of two identical particles. Keyword is two identical particles in a box. So does anybody notice any problem with this wave function? You see, uh, the keyword here is identical particles. For example, yeah, so you must have uh, read this uh, in your quantum mechanics courses that if you have identical particles, then either the wave functions have to be symmetrized if they are bosons or they have to be anti-symmetrized if they are fermions, right? And of course, there is a deep reason why that comes about, but let us not again go into that because uh, that takes many lectures to explain, yes, okay. So let us see this. So this is clearly not symmetrized. Right, because if I just exchange the indices, I get some other thing, right, clearly, right. So let us say I want to symmetrize or anti symmetrize it, then I will just write the answer and you can easily verify that this is the, this is the only correct answer. Okay. So, I have written a plus sign and I have written a minus sign. Which is the correct answer for two bosons and which is the correct answer for two fermions? Yeah, that's correct. So you can check that if it's two identical bosons, then I should put a plus sign and then it's symmetrized. And I have also put a root two for normalization. And if it's fermions, then there's a minus sign and I have also the one by square root two for normalization, okay? So far, so good. Everybody is happy, right? So this is the right basis of states if we have to consider identical particles. If we consider bosons, I will take the upper case. 
If I consider fermions, I'll take the lower case. But in what I'll do now, because it's simple enough, I'll do both cases simultaneously. Because this is just a two uh, particle problem. If I had more particles, I would be very scared of doing it like this. Uh, then there is something else called, uh, yeah, but there is also something else called second quantization, which I won't introduce here. Uh, but uh, I just give the keyword in case anybody is interested. But uh, basically for two particles, this is enough. For many particles, it's already clumsy to do it like this. Because a slater determinant also, if you write the determinant and expand it out, it has many, many, many terms, right? So it's not a very elegant way of doing it. So people have now much better ways of doing it, right? Good. Uh, so now we calculate again this object. Uh, for this two particle system. Again, I use the same trick. I would insert complete uh, states which are eigenstates of momentum in between so that this object becomes diagonal, right? So I just do that. This is diagonal, right? So I just use that, and then uh, so I'll erase that part now. So so I'll take probably ten more minutes. Is that okay? Right. But then I'll finish this. Okay, so from here, mm, sorry, this is in position. This E and this E are the same, so okay. so good. So now, uh, there is uh, one subtlety here because these are identical particles. See, uh, normally here I would do a free sum on k1 and k2, right? What do I mean by a free sum? I mean, uh, 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 if I am doing a free sum on k1 and k2, of course, uh, let us say there is one particular value, uh, I do not know, small k1 and small k2. Then of course, if you are doing a free sum, you should also allow the value small k2, small k1. If you are just doing a free sum over these indices. But you see, these are identical particles and exchanging k1 and k2 is like exchanging the coordinates of this particle, right? Because you see, what is the difference between this part and this part? It is just that one way of thinking about it is you are just exchanging k1 and k2, right? Because here k1 comes with x1 and here k2 comes with x1, right? So, really, because these are identical particles, you should only do half the sum, okay? That is subtlety number one, okay? Good. So, uh, where does the subtlety play around? I will now uh, use uh, this result and plug it in here and I will expand the product. So, see, this thing has two terms. So, the product will have four terms, right? But you see, out of those four terms, I should only take really two terms and then I will avoid this problem. I will do it and then you will see, right? But this is simply because uh, uh, if you are considering symmetric or anti-symmetric wave functions, uh, you should be careful of not over counting things. That is all. Okay? Good. 
Okay, so let's do that. So let's me let me put a symbol like this here, just to make sure that this is not a free sum, right? So this symbol means I'm taking care of this uh, property. Okay. So then there's a one by square root two and another one by square root two, right here and here. So there's a half which I pull out. Then there's this. Then there's it's mm. square k one square by two m. This is the easy piece from here. Then of course there are four terms in my wave function. Now let me write them carefully and let me not make any sign errors. Okay, but basically all I'm doing is literally taking this thing, right, and using it here. And then this guy would have two terms, that guy would have two terms, I'm just expanding and I'll get four terms. So if you just do it carefully, you'll exactly get this. Okay? So I'm not doing anything mysterious. So let me do this carefully. This is term one. Then comes term 2. Term 2 would have a plus sign if I have bosons. It would have a minus sign if I have fermions. Good. Then comes term 3. Again, plus sign for boson, minus sign for fermion. And the last term, which is plus both for bosons and fermions. Uh, yeah. Mm, so, okay. So that's just. Good. So there are these four terms. Now, let us look carefully. Look at this term and uh, the last one, this term. Look at the first term and the last term. Okay? So you see, all you have done here is uh, exchange coordinates here. So let's just see this guy. So you see, this guy, uh, let's look at the k1 here. This guy has x2 bar, this guy has x1 bar. Right? Let's look at k2 here, x1 bar, x2 bar. Similarly, look at this, look at that. So it's just exchanging coordinates between this and this. Same for these two terms. If you look at this term and that term, you have just exchanged coordinates, right? So then, as I said, you should not overcount, right? So you should just take this term and this term, and then you can just ignore this term and this term, right? Because uh, uh, they are just uh, uh, they are just uh, really the same state. They are not some distinct states, right? Okay, good. I hope everybody can see what I mean here, right? This term and this term, you can just uh, change these quantum numbers here, just exchange them, and you'll get this term. And same for these two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is a bit more subtle than that. Uh, no, no, no. no. See, if there was no concept of statistics here, you would have done the free sum, right? Because that's your definition of uh, yeah states. But because these are identical particles, uh, uh, having k1 comma k2 is identical to having the state k2 comma k1. There's no see the position of the quantum numbers does not matter. These are identical. Yeah, but. If they were actually two distinct particles, let's say one heavy particle and one light particle, then you would have done the entire sum. You see, so it's uh, more subtle than that. It's, it's just that k1 and k2 are both occupied. Exactly. That's it. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, whether you reverse. Yeah. 
Yeah, because they are identical particles. If they are just two arbitrary particles, different particles, maybe they have different mass, m1 and m2. Then you can distinguish them. Then you'll have to do the full sum. Yeah. And you don't even need to symmetrize or anti-symmetrize. You can. It doesn't change the answers, but yeah, good. Okay, now you see, I'll leave some steps for you to do at home, right? All you need to do is, as I said, you just take this guy and this guy, right? And ignore this guy and this guy, and then you can remove this thing from here, right? Then you can just do a full sum. And uh, then you already know what these guys are, right? This, uh, we just know, these are uh, the momentum eigenstates in the position representation. So you just plug that in, and then you have to again do Gaussian integrals and so on and so forth. But even before doing Gaussian integrals, you can just write this guy explicitly. So I'm sorry, I've left some steps here, but these steps are not uh, difficult. So again, this quantity will have some diagonal elements and some off diagonal elements, right? See, this is x1, x2. Here I can in general put x1 prime and x2 prime. But for simplicity of what I'm going to demonstrate, it's enough to put x1 and x2 here. So I'm just considering the diagonal part of this uh, density matrix in the position representation, diagonal in the positional representation. See, in quantum mechanics, whenever you say that, oh, I'm writing some matrix and I'm saying something is the diagonal part, something is the off-diagonal part, of course, that's a basis dependent statement, right? So when I say diagonal, I mean diagonal in the position basis, right? Good. Okay, so when I do this, uh, then if you do everything carefully, this is of course assuming that I have done everything carefully, you should get this. This is the same, uh, how do you pronounce it? Thermal wavelength. Thermal wavelength. <laughs> yes. So you get this interesting piece. So I'll just write it down in full glory. So here R12, this symbol R12 is just the separation between vector x1 and vector x2. So there's this interesting piece which comes here, okay? And I had defined this uh, thermal wavelength before. It's exactly the same again. And of course, you can also define the partition function from here. All that you know, need to do is d3 x1 and d3 x2 integration, right? So let's do that. If we do that, I'll again just write the answer. Uh, the partition, so, so let me just, so this is just to not confuse you. This is this guy. And I'll write the partition function, which is <laughs> some factor, but there's again a plus and a minus, 2 by v lambda q. So let's call that. So see, there are two particles in this system and there is a volume here. Uh, so this is, uh, if there were n particles, you would have gotten a similar factor of n by, sorry, capital N by V here. Okay, so right, good. So let's try to uh, uh, look at this. So you see, there are already some interesting things here. If you remember, what was the partition function for a single particle? The partition function for a single particle just had a v and had a lambda q, right? So in general, you would just expect that for two particles which are non-interacting, it's just the square of that, right? But there's already a factor of half here. That's the remnant of this 1 by n factorial that you put in an ad hoc manner in classical statmec to avoid all kinds of paradoxes. Okay, so it naturally comes here. If you do this for three particles, you would actually get a 1 by 3 factorial here. But that's, of course, more complicated. And <laughs> see, more complicated things you should do in the privacy of your room. <laughs> right? So you shouldn't do it in front of all these people, uh, all you people. Right? So <laughs> I'll make a mistake. But I mean, you can already see what's going to happen. Right? I mean, uh, the, it has a structure which is very clear. Good. Notice the second thing, which is also very interesting. If you have, instead of one particle, two particles, three particles, and so on, you will get, instead of two, you'll get a three, four, and so on. And this is like the 
density of uh, particles here, right? So, the uh, notation for that is small n density of particles, right? So, you see, if you just had classical mechanics, you would have just gotten this one here. You wouldn't have gotten a plus or a minus something, right? So, this already tells you that when do you recover the classical limit? You recover the classical limit when n times lambda cube is much, much smaller than 1. So, this simple exercise already tells you when you recover the classical limit and when quantum effects are important even for this non-interacting problem, right? I mean, uh, uh, so, yeah, good. So, of course, when this number is not small, this factor is a significant correction over 1. And so, this quantum problem of two particles is completely distinct from a classical problem of two particles, right? Is this the first correction from this G5 house and F5 house? So yeah. It looks like yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the first term. Right. But, but this is a very simple way of deriving it. It's very instructive because it shows hmm. actually that particles within lambda are. Right, exactly, exactly. I mean, this is the nice piece here, right, exactly, right. Yeah. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, I won't rub it out. Uh, so, the last bit which I want to say is, uh, so you see, I have this form here, right? So, I have this form here. In, in general, you can also look at this form here. This form is what? The probability amplitude, the amplitude of the particle to be in, of two particles to be in x1 and x2. Right? And you see, this has a spatial dependence over x1 minus x2. Right? How do you think you will mimic such an effect classically? Suppose I want to ask, okay, can you give me an equivalent classical problem to mimic this? Right? Of course, if there are two free particles with no interactions in between, you will never have a term like this. But the simple way to do it is, you just introduce an interaction between the two particles. That's it. You just introduce an interaction. And when you introduce an interaction, just from general statmec, you know that, uh, uh, sorry, I wrote u, right? Huh. So, you know that uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, so this is the probability that uh, uh, the first particle is at x1 and the second particle is at x2. Right? This just comes from the canonical uh, distribution function. Right? So, you see, basically, this means that uh, at a very coarse level, you can think of an effective classical interaction between these two particles, even though they are completely free. And automatically, you can also see that if you have fermions, the interaction is repulsive. Whereas, if you have bosons, the interaction is attractive. Because for fermions, there is a minus sign. And for bosons, there is a plus sign. Right? Also, you can immediately see that if you have fermions, then oh, that's correct. But let's say I expand this exponential, or or there's a better way. I take the log of this and lift it in the exponential. Then you can make the correspondence, whichever way. You can either expand that exponential, or you can lift this using a log. So, right. Okay. Good. Exactly, exactly, right, right. I mean, it's very simple to see why there is, for example, a repulsion for fermions, right? Because let's say I want to calculate the probability that x1 and x2 are identical. So, the two particles are sitting right on top of each other. So, then this r12 is 0, right? Because r12 is just the x1 minus x2, that vector, right? So, then I'm just doing 1 minus 1. So, that's precisely 0. Right? So, you immediately see that for fermions, that is not possible. And of course, we know this. This is just the Pauli exclusion principle. Right? And this also comes because, I mean, after all, Pauli exclusion principle is nothing but this statement that you have an anti-symmetrized uh, wave function for fermions. Right? So, good. So, both the one particle problem and the two particle problems already told us something interesting. One thing it told us is how to recover the classical limit. Second thing it told us is that there is this, uh, for identical particles, there is this uh, interesting quote unquote effective repulsion and effective attraction, depending on whether they are fermions or bosons. 
And the third thing it told us is it immediately gave us a rationalization of some arbitrary factors in the classical partition function like 1 by h to the 3n uh, and 1 by n factorial. So immediately it gave us that rationalization, right? So for today I would like to stop at this point and I really apologize for taking so much time. But yeah, so I think I'll stop here for today, right? Sorry, is, is this? Attraction. Uh, mm -hmm. That's correct. For free bosons, this is responsible for the uh, condensation of bosons. And in one of my lectures, I'll uh, show in detail how that comes about. Yes. Correct, correct, correct. For <coughs> free bosons, uh, this uh, picture, when extended to n particles, where n is large, will give you Bose Einstein condensation at low temperature. We can even calculate the temperature where it happens. So we'll do that calculation. It's not so difficult. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. I haven't, but maybe, you know, I mean, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Oh, I see. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. But here the meaning is clear, right? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's correct. Exactly, exactly. That's the exchange term. And that's what leads to that's where statistics becomes important because in one case you pick up a minus sign in the other case you pick up a plus sign that's correct and yes uh, uh, three particles what is the structure of this last answer x1 x2 x3 x1 x2 x3 oh here yeah. ah so, so exactly yeah yeah it's like all kinds of pairwise terms would come uh, I'm not completely sure whether there's anything else. I have to check that. But uh, to leading effect is just the three R1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1. But your question is, do I get something else? Uh, I have to check. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> exactly. Exactly. But the question is whether you can reduce it to two particles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Correct, correct. But these are non-interacting particles, so maybe, yeah, exactly, maybe you can, yeah. But honestly, I haven't done that exercise to its entirety, so, I mean, I think uh, you would get that, uh, just the simple structure, but I have to check, yes. Exactly, exactly. That's why it's good to write things in quantum mechanics in different representations, yes. Exactly, from the anti-symmetrization. No, the, no, I mean, this is the more fundamental way of looking at things, right? I mean, uh, of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, 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 but uh, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, I mean, but it's very uh, you sort of, you can instructively see that if you follow from there to here, you can never put, uh, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. Also, I mean, uh, uh, this thing that, uh, there is this particular sort of wavelength associated here and if your R12 becomes much more than that, it's effectively classical. That you can only see if you write it in the position basis, right? I mean, yeah, here it's the same. Yeah, because the thermal wavelength was already emerging for the one particle problem. So that's sort of, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. All right. Thank you. Uh, if there are no, there's no more questions, right? I guess.